Yes. Hi, <laughs> everybody. I'm realizing, like, literally everyone in this room is a name tag except for me, so. I mean, I know. Okay, good. And I'm not <laughs> yeah, the only speaker either, so I'm, like, I'm in the clear. Um, my talk is titled Game Development as a Visual Artist, or I like to draw a lot and I'm not really a gameplay mechanics person first. Um, so buckle up, everybody. This is me. I'm going to just talk about me real quick. Um, I'm a freelance illustrator by trade, but right now I am developing a video game. And my whole life I've wanted to, but for some reason I was like, I'm a visual artist, so I can't do that. And then two years ago I decided that was a load of crap. So now I am kind of in my first project trying to do a little bit of game development. So I wanted to talk a little bit about how my approach to especially game design has been and how I think it's kind of different from a more traditional approach to game design. Um, my project I'll talk about a bit. It's titled Margaret's Blight and the purpose for this game is to sort of combat harmful stereotypes and tropes against female characters in video games by incorporating or addressing these tropes in a way that kind of make players aware of how video games kind of set up your expectations for specific genders to be represented. Uh, the basic premise of it, you play as a badger warrior princess um, who's super badass. Uh, her name's Princess Margaret, and at the beginning of the game, she gets sealed in a magic crystal prison by a wizard. So it's super referential, obviously, to Legend of Zelda. There's a couple other games that do that, a couple other franchises. But she quickly finds out that the crystal doesn't actually do anything to her. It's kind of too small for her anyway. She can move outside of it. It just kind of follows her around and doesn't really do anything. <laughs> and it's sort of emblematic of like a role that a woman would commonly be assigned in a video game and how it doesn't affect her as a character. Um, before I even began considering game mechanics or gameplay at all, I had this specific premise set up. I had character designs done. I had character bios solidified. Um, I also had environmental design done. Um, here's a few of those spreads, some more high res than others. <laughs> Apologies. Um, and I also had an 80 page script that followed the narrative. It's way too long. That followed the narrative from start to finish. So before I even began to sit, consider gameplay mechanics, I knew what the game was going to be. I knew how it was going to start and end. I knew the characters. I knew how it was going to look. And so for me, kind of, I took this backwards approach where I set this whole concept up in this whole world, and then I decided to do game design as sort of a narrative tool to support all of that. So I really got to cherry pick kind of the type of game I wanted to make, especially with the mechanics. So a couple quick examples of that. Right now, it's living as a 2D side scroller, which is a format I very specifically chose because it's so standard, and I feel like it calls back to this classic era of video games in which a lot of these tropes solidified. So I felt like that would be kind of the best medium to communicate this. Um, this is a horribly large PDF I made. Um, sorry to my programmers. Um, other examples is I knew that I wanted her crystals in some way to affect the gameplay, but not necessarily to affect her as a character, just to show that this role she's been given doesn't have power over her. So that was kind of a design struggle for me, but my sort of solution to it to support my narrative was to have the crystal affect how she interacts with the world and not necessarily how she interacts with herself. So in the game, she'll run into other crystals in the world that she cannot phase through because of the one that follows her around. And this kind of added this puzzle mechanic to the game that I wasn't initially expecting, but I felt really tied into the narrative very well and sort of communicated this idea I wanted the players to have of this frustration of having to deal with a world when you have very rigid uh, gender role expectations placed on you. Um, some other examples of what we're working with right now, we're considering having a health bar that sort of refills depending on your engagement with enemies, because Margaret herself is a very aggressive character who grapples with her aggressive tendencies, so to have the player be kind of encouraged to play aggressively as Margaret was a goal we wanted to reach. And in that same vein, we wanted to incorporate some quick time actions in the game, which are those like really terrible, like press A to attack now or you die and you play the whole level over again. Um, but we wanted to incorporate those, but to not necessarily have them be a good thing. So there are some quick time actions you might take that'll actually do bad stuff and won't help you at all and kind of Creating this experience that goes with this concept of a player 
trying to keep their aggression in check and not hit that button right away and kind of think about it a little bit first. Um, that is super brief. I swear, you guys, the last time I spoke about this, it was 40 minutes long. You were there, you know. Um, yeah, so if you guys do want to know more about it, you can feel free and talk to me. I can talk about it for hours. Uh, I also write this newsletter. I try to do it once a month. I didn't do it last month, which is a secret, so don't tell anyone. <laughs> um, but you can sign up at this URL at the very bottom. I also have a clipboard. I don't have an iPad like Yuri suggested, but I have a clipboard if you guys want to come bother me. Um, I talk a little bit more about this process in depth. I also kind of share progress as I'm going and sort of my learning experience as an artist creating games. So that is all I have to talk about tonight. <laughs> Brilliant. I'm going to stop talking. How obvious is it to the player? How obvious is it? Yeah. Um, I, I'm not quite sure yet. I think that's going to come with a lot of play testing for sure. I kind of do want to ride this line where it's subtle enough that when you start playing it, you don't really like clue into the point of the game and, to, and it's kind of like incrementally introduced to a player. So there's a lot of like little bits in the story as it goes and in the gameplay as it goes. And I mean, you'll definitely understand it by the end of the game, but I kind of wanted it to be very accessible, that's why it's so cute. Like it, it does look like a game that children would play and I would love for children to play it. So it is kind of like a little subtle, but it's definitely there, yeah. You talked about uh, countering tropes that are present in like Legend of Zelda and I think specifically of Final Fantasy. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, why the decision to go for a 2D platformer over say a turn-based RPG or uh, like a top-down action game? Yeah, for sure. Um, I really, that's kind of like a couple different decisions led to that. I really like the idea of it sort of being this very standard format that people are familiar with, which makes it very accessible. Um, anyone can kind of pick it up and play around with it. But also, a lot of that did have to do with aesthetic, just because I'm a visual artist. I felt like a 2D side scroller um, would be something that would kind of suit my visuals very well. And I really like parallax scrolling, so <laughs> that's the answer. <laughs> uh, I, first, I want to say I really love the approach of kind of starting with the narrative and then getting the mechanics to fit for that. Uh, but that said, what have you run into? Have you run into any cases where you've had to work a little bit harder, maybe because you did the narrative first? Yeah, like, for what sure. are some of the difficulties that you ran in there designing the mechanics? Yeah, um, that's definitely, there have been a couple kind of road bumps in that way. And one of them I mentioned was like her crystal for a long time. I was really struggling with that. Like I had a lot of conversations with people where I was like, I really want it to like be important in the gameplay, but it cannot affect her as a character because that kind of destroys the whole point of the game where if it had any power over her or if she used it in any way and it kind of became helpful, that wouldn't really make any sense. So that one, that took, was like the most recent development in terms of gameplay for me was that one took the most thinking and it took me quite a long time to come to that decision. But thankfully I feel like I did come to something that kind of balanced it out. But that is, I mean, there is so much advice I read when I was studying up on video games not to start with a story first. And I think that's why. <laughs> because you do tend to run into those things. But for someone like me who is a visual and narrative thinker, it's kind of impossible to do it the other way around. So, And by the time I started or like hearing that advice, I was like way too far along in the process. So I was like, got to ignore it anyway. Um, but yeah, it does come with its own kind of pitfalls, but makes much more sense for me as an artist. Yeah, for sure. Um, well, I was lucky enough to do the concept work for this game as my senior thesis project while I was in college at PNCA. And through them, they sort of recommended a lot of resources, PigSquad included. I started coming to PigSquad events after I proposed my thesis project. Um, but it definitely is a lot of like making a lot of friends in the industry who have suggestions of resources to look at. I watch a lot of YouTube videos um, on game design. I'm kind of addicted to them now, although I don't agree with all of them. Um, but I'm a, I'm a super huge fan of basically all of Mark Brown's videos on YouTube, like Game Maker's Toolkit, I think is a really good kind of starting point for people that may not necessarily know the language, but can understand the concepts. He just kind of like breaks down games and talks about why they're good. So 
makes a lot of sense after you sort of do a little bit of studying, right? Like I'm not going to be designing levels myself, but I know how to speak about it and I know what's good and what I like. And that's kind of all I need to know from my position. So yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. As a designer and an illustrator, is there any kind of software that you think would be helpful for classes when they're talking about like writing about the software, actually being able to like have them try to make it? Um, I personally have not. I'm working mostly as a creative director. I'm speaking about gameplay. I'm not personally coding it myself. I'm using um, basically the Adobe suite of products for myself. My animator is using Flash and TV Paint. And I know that my coders right now are working in Unity, but that's, I'm still sort of, um, I anticipate a little bit more software exploration on my part further down in the process, but yeah, that's kind of where I'm at right now. Well, and Adobe has React, and you want to be experienced in beta. Oh. I'm going to write that down. <laughs> Thank you. Cool. Thanks, guys.